Did you know that for almost 2,000 years, the church, both Catholic and Protestant, has taught that God washed his hands of the Jewish people in the first century because they crucified Jesus? And did you know that another aspect of this teaching is that God replaced Israel with the church, and the church has inherited all the blessings promised to Israel? And did you know that at the opposite extreme, there are Christian leaders today who teach that the Jews do not need Jesus because they have their own unique way of salvation? Stay tuned for a discussion of these important issues. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I'm Nathan Jones, the web minister for Lamb and Lion Ministries, and I also serve as an associate evangelist with Dr. David Reagan. And the reason I'm opening this program up today is because he is going to be our special guest. That's right, I'm going to interview Dr. Reagan about his latest book, which is titled, The Jewish People Rejected or Beloved. Dave, I got to ask you a question first before we begin. Why is this seat more comfortable than that seat over there? Well, this is not a very comfortable seat. This is what I call the hot seat. The hot uh, this seat. is where I put the people that I interrogate, and so uh, I, it's kind of unusual for me to be here. Well, you <laughs> are going to do fine, I'm sure, and if I do fine here. Question for you. You love the Jewish people. I have never met a man in my life who has loved the Jewish people. You've led over 45 trips to Israel and toward Israel. You've spoken about Israel and Bible prophecy so much. I know you love Israel. Why then write a book about it? Obviously, superficially, it's because you're in love, but why personally did you write it? Well, I, I wrote it because of my love of Israel and of the Jewish people, because the world today and the church in particular is filled with all kinds of misunderstandings and myths about the Jewish people. And one of the things that really concerns me is that this is growing within the church to the point that even evangelical churches are being invaded by the myths, the misunderstandings, uh, the misrepresentations, and so I wanted to address those. Uh, the book deals, for example, with the relationship of the Jews with God. That's the fundamental thing. But also their relationship with um, the church and their relationship uh, to the land of Israel itself. All three of those areas are areas where there's tremendous myths today. For example, let's take the last one uh, concerning the land. Uh, the, the myth that is going around today and which people are buying hook, line, and sinker is that the Jews came into that land uh, in the early 20th century and stole it from the Palestinian people. Oh, you hear that all the time. Well, that's right. And uh, it, it's just as far from the truth as it can possibly be. I try to point out, I have a whole chapter in there about uh, their relationship with the land, and I point out that God promised this land to them through Abraham. And it became what they called their promised land. That was reaffirmed through Isaac. It was reaffirmed through Jacob. A thousand years later, David was talking about it in Psalm 105. This was an eternal covenant that God had given them. That land belongs to them eternally. When they got ready to enter the land under uh, Moses, he pointed out it's an eternal covenant. You will always have the deed to this land. And, uh, and, but there was another covenant, and that was the use covenant, the land use covenant. And God told them, if you are not faithful, I'm going to put judgments upon you. And the greatest judgment is you will be ejected from the land. But they didn't lose their title. The title is eternal. They were ejected because they were unfaithful. But the, God then said, in the end times, I'm going to bring you back. And, this, and He did that. He even said their land would become desolate. And you know, He did that on purpose to keep people from occupying the land. So when they came back in the early 1900s, the land was almost empty. It was mainly owned by foreign landholders in, in Syria. The people who lived there were poverty stricken and called themselves Syrians. There was no Palestinian identity. And the Jews didn't steal the land. They bought the land. And the Arabs laughed all the way to the bank that these crazy Jews are coming in and buying land that is filled with malaria infested swamps. Uh, the trees had been cut down. Nobody wanted this land except the Jewish people. Today they claim the Jews stole it from them, but that's not true. And furthermore, they have an eternal title to it. Mm -hmm. So you see the book then as an apologetics against all the slander against the Jewish people. That is basically what it is, an apologetic, and it uh, deals with a lot of, of different uh, uh, aspects of what people say about the Jewish people. It has to do, again, with their relationship with God, okay. their relationship with uh, uh, the church, and their relationship with the land. 
I liked how you, you began it. I think your thesis is right there by quoting Deuteronomy 7, 6. And it says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. God sees the Jewish people as beloved, and you beloved the Jewish people as well. Well, yes, and he says, if you touch the Jewish people, talking about it in an improper way, you touch my eye. Apple of his eye. Yeah, yes. the apple of his eye. And so, so you better a... be careful. And in fact, it mm -hmm. says in Joel chapter 3, if you mess with my people in the end time by trying to divide up their land, I will deal with you. And that is a, that's a warning of the United States of America as well as, as all the nations of the world. So this book also then protects people from making the mistake of slandering the Jewish people. I hope so. Welcome back to Christ and Prophecy and my interview of our ministry's founder, Dr. David Reagan. I'm asking him questions about his newest book, The Jewish People Rejected or Beloved. Dr. Reagan, in chapter 5 you say that replacement theology is evil. The, the chapter is titled The Evil of Replacement Theology. Wow, evil. What <laughs> makes replacement theology evil? Because most churches today hold to replacement theology, the idea that the church has replaced Israel and taken on all their blessings. Yes, well uh, let me go into a little bit more detail first of all about what replacement theology is before I tell you why I think it's so evil. Okay. And it is very evil. Replacement theology is an idea that God, as you said at the very beginning of the program, washed His hands of the Jewish people because they were guilty of deicide, which is a word that means the killing of God. They killed, the, they're blamed for the killing of Jesus. And that He replaced the uh, Jewish people with the church, giving to the church all the blessings that He had ever blessed the Jewish people, leaving them with all the curses, but the church getting the blessings. Now, this developed very early in the history of the church. Uh, as you well know, when the church was founded, everyone in it was Jewish. Mm -hmm. It was 100% oh, yeah. Jewish. Even Luke, uh, probably. Uh, it, 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 yes, it all written the, uh, the Jewish writers, the Jewish members, the Jewish leaders. Uh, but very early on, the church began to grow very rapidly among Gentile believers. And before long, the Gentile believers were 10 times, 100 times more than the Jewish believers. And the Gentile believers began to turn on the Jewish believers and began to denounce them. Now, this is very interesting because early in the church, it was the other way around. The Jews predominated, and when the Gentiles started coming in, the Jews were very gracious to them. They said, No, you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to follow the law of Moses. You, you don't have to do those things. You don't have to become a Jew in order to be a Christian. But within a very short period of time, within less than a hundred years, the Gentiles had dominated the church, and they were suddenly saying to Jews, You can't be a Christian and remain a Jew. You've got to become a Gentile. You've got to put aside all your Jewish practices, everything that has anything to do with Judaism. And then they began to, to put this, this, uh, uh, this monkey on the back of the Jewish people of saying, okay, you really don't have any rights at all because you killed God. Now, it's interesting in the book of Acts it says yeah. who killed Jesus Christ. It says it was the Romans it says it was the Jews, it said it was the Gentiles, and of course you and me. You and me. Yes. Yeah, that's Because why we all are responsible for the death of Jesus. He died for our sins and the sins of the world. But no, the church has always focused on the Jews and has denounced the Jews for being the killers of Jesus. So this began to build over the ages. By the time it got to the Middle Ages, this was the accepted doctrine of the church. Jews are to be hated, Jews are to be persecuted because Jews were Christ killers. And this was actually taught by the church. It's your responsibility to persecute Jews. And they were terribly persecuted. And in the Middle Ages they came up with the Passion Plays, which were, uh, people thought, well that was all about wonderful plays about the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Well they were, but they were also plays to try to, to keep this anti-Semitism going because all of the Jewish characters wore big hooked noses and when they'd come on the stage they would boo them and throw things at them. And it was designed to, to keep that hatred of the Jews going. And then you had the myths during the Middle Ages that the Jews were polluting the wells of the Gentiles and the Jews were kidnapping Gentile kids and, and taking their blood and using it for Passover. And, and you know, even during the Black Plague they blamed that on the Jews because the Jews didn't die as much as the Gentiles because they followed the hygienic, hygienic rules, rules of the Law of Moses, yes. So it, it just went on and on until finally what happened is at the Reformation 
when Luther said, let's get back to the Word of God, everybody thought at long last, you know, this is going to be it. We'll get back to the Word of God. This anti-Semitism will stop. And Luther even wrote some, uh, some, some uh, documents in which he said that he thought that the Jews were very intelligent and the reason that they had not come to the Gospel was because the church had perverted the Gospel. But now that he had restored it, they would come back in big numbers. Yeah, Luther didn't stay to that view too long. Well, did he? when they didn't come back in big numbers, yeah. he turned against them. And in fact, that's what most people don't know is that Martin Luther, who's one of the great heroes of the Christian faith, was a man who ended his life writing some of the worst things that have ever been written about the Jewish people. For example, he called them a miserable and a cursed people, stupid fools, miserable, blind, and senseless, thieves and robbers, the great vermin of humanity, lazy rogues, blind and venomous. And this and, is the father of the Reformation. Yes, and then he father even wrote a document, and you can find, all you have to do is get on the internet and type Martin Luther Jews, okay. and you'll find that he wrote a document in which he said point blank, their synagogues and schools should be burned, their houses should be destroyed, their Talmudic writings should be confiscated, their rabbis should be forbidden to teach, their money should be taken from them, and they should be compelled into forced labor. And, and now, this, Luther's that's views formed the foundation, though, of a big movement in the 20th century, right, that wiped out many of the Jews well, in the yeah, Holocaust? Well, yeah, because uh, in Mein Kampf, Hitler's Hitler fire, said, yeah that he considered Luther to be a great warrior, a true statesman, and a great reformer. And in fact at the Nuremberg war crime trials after World War II, the Nazi leaders said, all we were doing is what Luther told us to do. Most Christians wow. do not understand that Jews consider the Holocaust to be a Christian action. Mm -hmm. That it was something that Christians did to Jews. Well, of course, they were quoting Luther. Most of the uh, uh, Nazis uh, were members of, of churches. Uh, they would celebrate Christmas. All this was done in the, in the name of Christ. And it's no wonder that Jews today uh, have such a, a negative attitude toward Christianity and are very suspicious of any Christian who wants to share the Gospel with them because of the way they have been treated. And so, uh, the Holocaust was really the culmination of almost 2,000 years of Christian anti-Semitism. And I go, I, I document it in great detail. I mean year, century by century what, the, what was said about the Jewish people and how they were so horribly persecuted because they were called Christ killers. No wonder the Jews hate the church so much because we have a reputation and a history of persecuting them. And, and what happened is because of, the, uh, of that, after the war was over, anti-Semitism has sort of calmed down, but it's re-emerging today oh, yeah. in the name of anti-Zionism. Uh, they used to say the Jews can't live in our country. Now they're saying the Jews can't live in their own country. <laughs> so you have anti-Zionism and some of the most virulent anti-Semites on the scene today are Christian spokesmen who are anti-Zionists. Welcome back to Christ and Prophecy and my interview of Dr. David Reagan about his new book, The Jewish People Rejected or Beloved. Dave, another chapter, chapter 6 in your book really touched me. It's called The Tragedy of Dual Covenant Theology. Now, I don't think most people don't understand yeah. what dual covenant theology is. Can you explain that? And you use the word tragedy, which again is a very weighty word. Why a tragedy? Well, uh, most, you're right. Most people have never even heard of dual covenant theology, but it's been around for a long time. It uh, originally was characteristic of the most liberal denominations in the United States because uh, these denominations take the position more and more that there are many roads to God. There is the Muslim road and the Jewish road and the Christian road and the Hindu road and who are we to say that, uh, uh, you know, that Christianity is the only way <coughs> to God? Well, Jesus Christ said it. Yeah. He said, I am the only way. But anyway, uh, it was characteristic of liberal groups. And, and basically what it says is that the Jews really do not need Jesus because they have their own way to God. Their way is by following the Torah, following the, mo uh, the, the laws of Moses, and if they are faithful to those laws and have their faith in God, then, then they have a, their own way. And, and, and it's really an insult to them uh, to try to share Jesus with them, uh, that it's an insult to their culture and whatever. But what is so upsetting to me, and one of the re fundamental reasons I wrote this book, is because this view, unbelievably, is now going into the evangelical movement. Okay. In fact, one of the best known pastors in America today who is on television constantly and is a household name 
is one of the major advocates of dual covenant theology. He says that the Jews do not need Jesus. He says it is a waste of time to even preach to the Jews or to share in the gospel with them. And, and yet, as you well know, how does Romans 1 start out? The gospel is for the Jew first and then the Gentile. Well, I think and, the Bible is pretty explicit. Uh, Acts 4.12, there's no sal there is salvation, no one else. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we might be saved. Or Jesus in John 14.6 said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. The Bible is crystal clear, right? Yes, and, and the, th the really tragic thing about <coughs> this is uh, what I've noticed over the years is that um, when people discover the Jewish roots of Christianity, they get excited because yeah. they, you know most people don't know our Jewish roots, and, and it is exciting to discover the Jewish roots. And then they begin to study those Jewish roots, and as they study them, they begin to develop a love for the Jewish people and a love for the Hebrew Scriptures that they never had before. And then what I find is it's, this ultimately begins to morph into a, a, a feeling of, well, Surely, if, if they're the chosen people of God, if, if God loves them so much and, and if they've contributed so much, then surely they have some other way to get to God other than Jesus Christ, and, and we just must be loving of them. And so, the tragedy of dual covenant theology is that people end up loving the Jewish people into hell. I've heard you say that before, and the pushback from these people is, is usually rage oh. that you could say that they're loving the Jewish people to hell, but that's exactly what they're doing, right? By depriving them of Jesus and the gospel, they're depriving them the only way to salvation and thus sending them to hell, right? Yeah, and, and some of, and see some of my best friends fall into this category because uh, they are Christian Zionists. A uh, Christian Zionist is a, uh, is a Christian who believes that the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people, that they have a right to it, and uh, that uh, we need to stand firmly behind them and support their right. But many of the Christian Zionists that I have met, uh, not most, but many, mm -hmm. have moved into this situation where they think, well, there must be some way for the Jewish people uh, to be saved other than Jesus Christ because they're so uh, rejecting of, of Jesus and yet at the same time I know that they're God's chosen people and so there must be a way. But they don't understand what chosen means. Chosen does not mean that they're saved. Yeah. Chosen means that they have been set aside by God to be a witness of Him in the world. And they are a witness. Uh, they are a witness that, that of what it means to have a relationship with God. That when you are faithful to God, He blesses. When you are unfaithful, He disciplines. And He has them under discipline right now. When you repent, He forgives, He forgets, and He blesses again. And we're told in the Bible that at the end of the tribulation uh, period of time, that's so, so seven years of tribulation, that during that time two-thirds of the Jewish people are going to die at the hands of the Antichrist. Second Only one-third will live to the end. It's going to be a greater holocaust than the Nazi holocaust. Right. But it says that at the end of the tribulation when they come to the end of themselves that they will look upon Him whom they pierced and weep and will and mourn as they weep over the loss of an only son. And they will accept Jesus as their Messiah. In fact, Jesus Himself said, I will not return until the Jewish people are willing to say, Baruch HaBa Shem Adonai, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. So even those Scriptures make it crystal clear that the Jews have no hope apart from Jesus Christ. And yet these folks say, oh no, it is it is uh, uh, not proper to share the gospel with a Jew. And in fact, I have even known of situations where people were sharing the gospel with Jews and some of these Christian leaders would find out about it and interject themselves and tell these people, you don't need Jesus. But are Jews getting saved today? Oh yes. And see, that's yeah. when, when, when these people say it's a waste of time to share the gospel with a Jew, they are ignoring the fact that since 1967, since the Six-Day War, more Jews have been saved, more Jews have come to Jesus, accepted Yeshua as their Messiah than ever before in all the history of wow. Christianity. There is a tremendous, there was not one Messianic synagogue, not one in 1967 when the Six-Day War occurred. Today there are hundreds in the United States all over the world because Jews are coming to Jesus as never before and yet these people are saying, don't share the Gospel with Jews because it's a waste of time. Almost sounds like a satanic deception. Well it is. There, it, that's the only thing it can be is it, it is a satanic deception. And, and it breaks my heart because I know these people love the Jewish oh, people, yeah. they mean well, but boy you talk about a deception. Let me tell you, everybody needs Jesus. I don't care whether Hindu, Muslim, <laughs> Jew, 
pagan, atheist, whatever. They need Jesus Christ because He is the only hope of the world. He is the only hope for our salvation. There is no salvation apart from Jesus. You can't earn it on your own. You certainly can't earn it by following the law of Moses no. because uh, no one was ever able to do that. The law was given to convince us that we needed a Savior. And in fact, Jeremiah himself said, one day it will be replaced by a new covenant. The law of Moses is not even in effect now. It is the new covenant that came into effect with the death of Jesus Christ, who is our only hope. Welcome back to Christ and Prophecy. I'm discussing with Dr. Reagan his newest book entitled, The Jewish People Rejected or Beloved. In addition to the two chapters we've been discussing, the book contains seven other chapters with titles like these. Is there any hope for Israel? The Middle East Crisis in Biblical Perspective? The most important prophetic development of the 20th century? The horror of the Holocaust? Israel's covenants with God? The phenomenon of Messianic Judaism? The hope of Christian Zionism? Mm -hmm. And even has an appendix down there, the Willow Bank Declaration, which is a great read. Dr. Reagan, I want to go back to chapter 3. You say the most important development of the 20th century. I mean, that was a busy century. <laughs> so, what then is the most, I mean, I don't know if you want people to read it first to find out, or do you want to tell us what the most important prophetic no, development No, no, I'll, I'll tell you about right, it. Well, we you. go into great detail here, okay. about it here in the book. But, yeah, let me just give you a brief overview. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt the most important prophetic, de prophetic development of the 20th century was the regathering of the Jewish people from the four corners of the earth. God said, if you are disobedient to me, I'm going to scatter you all over the world. And that occurred uh, beginning in 70 AD when the Romans uh, conquered Jerusalem. And later on, on under the Second Revolt, it, it spread even more. By the beginning of the 20th century, there were Jews on every continent in the United States. There were, there were Austra uh, not the United States, but the world. There, there were Austra uh, Australian Jews. There were Latin American Jews and African Jews and Asian Jews. They were everywhere. God had spread them all over. The and everywhere they went, He said, you will be persecuted. And they were. He said something else though. He said, I will preserve you. And no other people in all of history have been scattered all over the world and been preserved. I mean, you you look in the Bible, and everybody's against the Jews, the Babylonians, the Persians, the the uh, uh, you know uh, the Hittites, the Moabites, the Amorites. <laughs> they're all against the <laughs> Jews. And yet, where are they today? They're all in the dustbin of history. Where are the Jews? Back in their land. God said, "I'll preserve you." So He said, "I'll scatter you. You'll be persecuted. I'll preserve you." And one day I will bring you back into that land. And that is what He's doing. He is bringing them back into the land. At the beginning of the 20th century there were only 40,000 Jews in all the land. By the end of World War II, 600,000. Today over 6 million, as many as were killed in the Holocaust. And they continue to come from over 120 nations in the world. Nothing like it has ever happened in history before. I don't know how anyone can look at this and say it is not a work of God. And yet there are many people who look at that and say, well, it's just an accident of history. It, it's God's hand. Even the Jews, or as many of the Orthodox Jews recognize that it's God's hand that has brought them back. And He's bringing them back for a reason. And the reason is to bring all the nations of the world together against them and to hammer them as no nation has ever been hammered, not because He hates them, because He loves them. He wants to bring them to the end of themselves. And when He does that they will turn to Him. You see, in the Old Testament every time they got in trouble they ran to Egypt. Modern day times, they get in trouble where they come. United, United States. States yeah. Even we are turning against them. It's going to come to where there is no one for them to turn to. And when they get to the end of themselves, they will turn to God. And a great remnant will be saved to the everlasting glory of God. So, God has a purpose in regathering them from the four corners of the earth. And I believe that is the most important prophetic development of the 20th century. And it led to other things. Once you regather them, then the next obvious thing you do is you reestablish the state, which happened on May the 14th, 1948. And then the next obvious thing is that you reconquer the city of Jerusalem, your, your eternal capital, the one, the, the city that is, that city has only been the capital of one nation in all of history, and that's Israel. It was never a capital of any other nation. And so, that happened in June of 1967. So, you've got them coming back, you've got them there. And, and the thing that's interesting to me about that, and I know you've heard me mention this before, but on June the 7th, 1967, when the Jews reconquered the old city for the first time in 1800 years, they rushed to the Western Wall, they began to weep and wail. And Rabbi Shlomo Gorham, the chief rabbi of the Israeli army, who later became the chief rabbi of Israel, came up to that wall 
and he had a Torah scroll under one arm, and he had a shofar in his other hand. And you have to see photographs of oh, this. Yeah. He blew the shofar, and he said, I proclaim to you the beginning of the Messianic age. Now, why did he do that? Because he knows the Old Testament prophecies that say, when the Jew is back in the land, and the Jew is back in the city, the Messiah is going to come. I agree with you totally. The idea, and I don't think people really understand what a miracle Israel being regathered into yeah. the nation again. Because sure, there could be a people group, say the uh, Mayans, the descendants. <laughs> they live in the same area. They can say, hey, thou hundreds of years ago we used to be part of the Mayan Empire or the Aztec yeah. Empire. But not when you scatter a people to the four corners of the wind where they have to live in different cultures and speak different languages. And keep their identity. And keep their identity. So a Jew is a Jew. I grew up with many Jews in, up in Philadelphia, oh, and yeah. even though they're American citizens, they keep their identity. Even if they're not practicing Jews, they keep their identity. And I think the Lord has made them so con concentrated on tradition because it's kept their identity so He could regather them. And now they're speaking Hebrew in their own country yeah. again, a dead language. I mean, it is a miracle, and I totally agree. And I might add that I think <clears throat> thus far, if you were to ask me what's the most important prophetic development of the 21st century. That I'd like to know. I would say it is all of the nations of the world coming together against Israel. Because yeah. that is the last of these prophecies concerning Israel. And that's where we are. Even the United States of America, which has been Israel's greatest friend, we began to turn against them under the first Bush administration when we demanded that they start trading land for peace. An appeasement process that does nothing but whet the appetite of the aggressor. And now under the Obama administration uh, almost a complete rejection of Israel, just putting them aside and demanding that they basically commit suicide by uh, surrendering their heartland. So, we have joined all the nations of the world, and the Bible is very specific about this, in the end time all the nations are going to come against Israel. So, we're living in exciting times. Yes, we are. We're seeing prophecies fulfilled before our eyes that point to the fact that Jesus is about to return. Amen. Now, that's a great way to end it. So I'm going to end it, folks. That's our time for this week. In just a moment, our announcer will tell you how you can secure a copy of Dr. Reagan's new book. Now, I hope our program today has been a blessing to you, and I hope you'll be back with us again next week, the Lord willing. Until then, this is Nathan Jones speaking for myself and Dr. David Reagan saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. My new book about the Jewish people addresses some very intriguing questions such as these. Have the Jews ceased to be God's chosen people? Are they guilty of the unforgivable sin of killing God? Has God replaced them with the church? Have they lost all hope as a nation? Are they devoid of any role in these end times? If God still loves them, how could He allow them to experience the Holocaust? And do they have their own way of salvation separate and apart from Jesus? Although this book deals with major theological issues, it is not written for theologians. It's written in my usual down-to-earth, easy-to-understand style. The book can be yours for a gift of $15 or more, plus the cost of shipping. To order, call the number you see on the screen or place your order through our website at lambline.com. If you call, please do so between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Time, Monday through Friday. I would also like to invite you to explore our interactive website at lambline.com. You can watch our past TV programs there, as well as other video programs. You can use the site's high-speed search engine to do research about Bible prophecy topics. And you can submit questions to our web ministry. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. Jewish people. I have never met a man in my life who has loved the Jewish people. You've led over 45 trips to Israel and toured Israel. You've spoken about Israel and Bible prophecy so much. I know you love Israel. Why then write a book about it? Obviously, superficially, it's because you're in love, but why personally did you write it? Well, I, I wrote it because of my love of Israel and of the Jewish people, because the world today and the church in particular is filled with all kinds of misunderstandings and myths about the Jewish people. And one of the things that really concerns me is that this is growing within the church to the point that even evangelical churches are being invaded by the myths, the misunderstandings, uh, the misrepresentations. And so I wanted to address those. Um, uh, the book deals, for example, with the relationship of the Jews with God. That's the fundamental thing. But also their relationship with um, the church and their relationship uh, to the land of Israel itself. All three of those areas are areas where there's tremendous myths today. For example, let's take the last one uh, concerning the land. 
the, the myth that is going around today and which people are buying hook, line and sinker is that the Jews came into that land uh, in the early 20th century and stole it from the Palestinian people. Oh, you hear that all the time. Well, that's right. And uh, it, it's just as far from the truth as it can possibly be. I try to point out, I have a whole chapter in there about uh, their relationship with the land and I point out that God promised this land to them through Abraham. And it became what they called their promised land. That was reaffirmed through Isaac. It was reaffirmed through Jacob. A thousand years later, David was talking about it in Psalm 105. It, this was an eternal covenant. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I'm Nathan Jones, the Web Minister for Lamb and Lion Ministries. And I also serve as an Associate Evangelist with Dr. David Reagan. And the reason I'm opening this program up today is because he is going to be our special guest. That's right, I'm going to interview Dr. Reagan about his latest book, which is titled, The Jewish People Rejected or Beloved. Dave, i got to ask you a question first before we begin. Why is this seat more comfortable than that seat over there? Well, this is not a very comfortable seat. This is what I call the hot seat. The hot uh, this seat. is where I put the people that I interrogate, and so uh, it's kind of unusual for me to be here. Well, you <laughs> are going to do fine, I'm sure, and if I do fine here. Question for you. You love the Did you know that for almost 2,000 years the church, both Catholic and Protestant, has taught that God washed His hands of the Jewish people in the first century because they crucified Jesus? And did you know that another aspect of this teaching is that God replaced Israel with the church, and the church has inherited all the blessings promised to Israel? And did you know that at the opposite extreme, there are Christian leaders today who teach that the Jews do not need Jesus because they have their own unique way of salvation? Stay tuned for a discussion of these important issues. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. That God had given them, that land belongs to them eternally. When they got ready to enter the land under uh, Moses, he pointed out it's an eternal covenant. You will always have the deed to this land. And, uh, and, but there was another covenant, and that was the use covenant, the land use covenant. And God told them, if you are not faithful, I'm going to put judgments upon you, and the greatest judgment is you will be ejected from the land. But they didn't lose their title. The title is eternal. They were ejected because they were unfaithful. But the, God then said, in the end times, I'm going to bring you back. And, this, and He did that. He even said their land would become desolate. And you know, He did that on purpose to keep people from occupying the land. So when they came back in the early 1900s, the land was almost empty. It was mainly owned by foreign landholders in, in Syria. The people who lived there were poverty stricken and called themselves Syrians. There was no Palestinian.